if you look at my resume, if you don't, if you look at the last, say, 20 years or so, I've been doing a lot of research related to sustainable transportation. So you're going to think, I am an outsider. But the truth is, I too have a background in motors. I am a motor geek, just like you. In fact, uh, about 25 years ago, I wrote a book. It was the first book I ever wrote, Energy Efficient Electric Motor Systems. These were three-phase industrial motors. I was working as an energy conservation specialist for the Washington State Energy Office. And um, somebody needed to pull together all of the ways to make sure electric motors operate at maximum efficiency. Has nothing to do with the motors that you guys are working with. Uh, you're working with cute little tiny things, not big, hulky uh, industrial motors. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of my credential there. Um, it was a terrible selling book. Um, it was based on the assumption that the price of electricity was going to go up between 19, say 1990 and uh, tw year 2000 or 2010. And actually, the real price of electricity declined most of that time, and there really wasn't that much interest in uh, energy, industrial energy optimization like we thought. But anyway, it was an interesting exercise. I'm going to get back to the subject of my presentation here, which is sustainability. Um, sustainability is about balancing economic, social, and environmental objectives. And a lot of people misunderstand this. They think sustainability is just environmental sustainability. And a lot of my work is to remind environmentalists or remind anybody who's involved in this, uh, this discussion that economic and social sustainability are equally important. So let me ask you this. Is a transportation system sustainable if all vehicles are electric powered? No, no? why not? Okay, it depends on where the power comes from. So if it's a, if it's a non renewable power, you would say it's not sustainable. Anything else? Okay, so you need enough charging stations. Anything else? Right, there's the efficiency. But if you use the sustainability definition that I emphasize, which is balancing economic, social, and environmental objectives, you would say that, yes, electric vehicles produce less pollution and consume less non-renewable resources, but they do nothing to reduce traffic congestion. They re do nothing to reduce road and parking facility costs. They don't, uh, inc uh, uh, they don't help people who, who are unable to drive. Um, they don't help people uh, who can't afford the cost of owning a car. And would you rather be run over by an electric car than a gasoline-powered car? Um, it doesn't matter. It's not to say electric-powered vehicles are bad and that reducing air pollution and non-renewable resource consumption is, is, is undesirable. But I want to emphasize that sustainability is a much broader set of issues and that you can't uh, call something sustainable just because you're addressing one of many of the sustainability objectives. So in my conventional work, um, not specific to aviation, I often use this framework. So um, I identify, okay, so you can start off, often a planning process starts off with a problem statement. Problems are things you don't want. Um, I prefer to flip everything around and turn those into goal statements or objectives. Goals are things that you do want. And so basically, goal, problems and goals are, are, are two sides, are different ways of saying the same thing. And objectives are getting a little bit more specific. A goal is a general thing that you want, and an objective is a way of achieving a goal. 
So from a planning perspective, I think it's useful to declare what your objectives are. What are you trying to do? And it just puts everything in one, you're, you're saying, this is what we want. And certainly, you know, in transportation planning, we want to reduce traffic congestion and reduce the cost of building roads and parking facilities and save consumers money and improve mobility options for people who can't drive or um, improve safety and conserve energy and reduce pollution and help achieve some land use objectives and improve public fitness and health. And if you are uh, either, let's say, a city councilor or a or a city planner or, a, any, or just a community member, it is very useful to start off just basically defining what are we trying to do here. And I would say that having this type of comprehensive list of, of goals and objectives is the starting point for doing sustainability planning. And so in a lot of my work I ask, okay, how well, how many of these planning objectives are we achieving if we do something like expand roads. And under optimistic um, assumptions, expanding roads will reduce traffic congestion. Now, in most cases, expanding an urban road only gives you a temporary reduction in congestion, and pretty soon it's filled with latent demand. But even so, you know, you can, to some degree, you're reducing congestion. And if we get everybody to drive a super efficient hybrid car or an electric car, how many of these planning objectives are we achieving? Well, generally just two. We're reducing our energy consumption and we're reducing our pollution emissions. And those are good things. You know, reducing congestion and reducing pollution are good things. But if we create a more efficient transportation system where people can use a more resource efficient mode of travel, and we create communities where you, the distances that people have to travel are reduced, then we're tending to achieve virtually all of these planning objectives. And so it is this, this system perspective that I advocate. So we're going to get to this in a minute. Um, but first, I want to have some fun. Uh, I want to look back to what we were promised when we were kids. Okay, remember when the 21st century was the future? And we saw, especially in the science fiction or the futuristic literature, all the exciting things that our transportation system was gonna look like in the 21st century. And so we had promise, oh, 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 yeah. We had promises of flying cars and self-driving cars, of course, and jet packs, and 2001, a space odyssey predicted that by 2001, which is 17 years ago, you would be able to fly to the moon on a commercial Pan Am spaceship. And, okay, here's an interesting one. Um, for between 1976 and the year 2003, you could fly on a Concorde spaceship, or not spaceship, a supersonic jet uh, across the Atlantic. And there, were, there was this exciting future that was promised. So let me ask you this. How many of you came here in a flying car? Raise your hand if you came in a flying car. Okay, nobody? How about a Segway? Did anybody get here on a Segway? Uh, autonomous self-driving ca car? Did anybody come here in that? Okay, what about jetpacks? Did you? Get here on a jetpack? Okay. So the 21st century, the future that we were promised, the future transportation options that we were promised have not really become common. Um, but by the way, is it, did anybody fly on a supersonic jet during the 21st century? Anybody here? No. Okay. Um, but there is an important new mode of transportation that I'll bet half the people in this room have used in the last 24 hours. And I can almost guarantee your parents did not use it on their honeymoon. What is the important new mode of transportation for the 21st century? Uber is not a mode of transportation, it's a service, but it's not a mode. 
Wheeled luggage. How many, raise your hand if you have used wheeled luggage in the last 48 hours or so. Okay, so wheeled luggage really is the important new mode of transportation. And that is important because it's a reminder that the most important form of transportation, the most fundamental form of transportation is walking. And everything else comes out of walking. Let me ask you this. What is the high point when NASA spends, sends a, a spaceship to the moon? What's the high point of the trip to the moon? The moonwalk. And what about going up to a space station? What's the high point of a trip to the space station? A spacewalk, yeah. NASA is just another public transit agency that's a facilitating <laughs> multimodal transportation. Okay, so um, for, for those of us working in long-term transportation planning, there really has been a fundamental shift, a paradigm shift in how we think about these problems. Uh, I won't go into the details, but it's, it's about shifting. A lot of it is shifting from focusing on mobility, that is physical travel, to focusing on accessibility, your ability to get what you want. So, um, uh, and, and that emphasized the importance of multimodalism, that recognizing that each form of transportation, walking, cycling, public transit, ride sharing, uh, telecommuting, all of those have an important role to play. And then an efficient and equitable transportation system allows people to use the most efficient, resource efficient and affordable form of transportation for each trip. Okay, and this is kind of what it looks like in from terms of de design. If we focus on mobility, we say transportation is all about moving and, and vehicle travel. We're building wider and wider roads and we're trying to accommodate more vehicle travel. Uh, if we're focused on, on accessibility, we want to create communities where many of the things that you need, many of the services and activities that you need are nearby and many of them you can reach without even a motor vehicle trip. You can walk to a local store. Um, or your children can bicycle to school, and that there's an efficiency in creating that. Um, now, of all the things, of all the common um, activities that you engage in, that people engage in, and all of the things that you have to buy, motor vehicles tend to be, um, are typically the most resource intensive and one of the most expensive. So, and what's important is, the, these costs, that is the amount of land used for transportation, the amount of, of energy used for transportation, the amount of, land, of um, uh, um, 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 the financial costs, and the amount of time that people have to devote to transportation is extremely variable. So if you can live in a walkable, transit-oriented neighborhood and not own a car, your... Um, financial, your, the portion of your household budget devoted to transportation, the amount of land that you need for roads and parking, and the amount of energy consumption and pollution emissions are, are a, a far, far lower, essentially an order of magnitude lower than if your same, that same household was to locate in an automobile dependent area where every adult has to own a car and drive a lot. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, if you live a demographically average family living in a walkable urban neighborhood can do just fine living car free. Um, so let's, let me, and I, I want to mention, this is not about environment versus the economy. It's not about taking something away and reducing economic productivity. There's also good research showing that the com communities where people drive less are actually more economically productive. This is GDP per capita uh, versus per capita vehicle uh, miles uh, for US urban regions using US data sets. And um, there are many reasons to say that the more compact, less automobile dependent regions, because of agglomeration efficiencies and resource efficiencies, are actually more productive, economically productive. So um, part of this is about valuing multimodalism, this idea that we should learn to use each mode of travel for what it does best. 
Um, so um, this allows people to choose the most efficient mode of transportation. And um, if you're a planner, sometimes you talk, you, the, what the, the term that we often use is transit-oriented development, although the truth is that the transit is just a catalyst. The real key is that you're creating compact neighborhoods where people can reduce their car ownership and use, where it is easy to get around without, easy to get most of what you need without having to drive, and that means your household doesn't need to own as many cars. In a lot of cases, you can be car free. Um, and so this is a pretty good vision of a truly sustainable community, a place where you're, a, a good indicator is that your children can walk to school, and you, when you go out for a drink, you can walk home from the pub. Okay, so there are many benefits from creating this kind of uh, compact, multimodal community, and there are economic benefits, uh, uh, reduced traffic and parking congestion, and there are social benefits. There's good research showing that children from low-income households that grow up in a more compact, multimodal community um, have a greater chance of being economically successful as an adult than if they were to grow up in sprawl and you get very large reductions in traffic accidents and people tend to exercise more if they live in a walkable community and people get, tend to get to know their neighbors more. And then there are some environmental benefits and I won't go into details. By the way, I'm happy to share my slides so if you're interested, uh, get my business card after this and I'll be glad to, to share them with you. Okay, so um, public transit does have an important role to play in making all this happen. It does have, uh, even if you only use the, the public transit a few times a month, like me, I'm a car free, uh, our family is car free, we get around mainly by walking and bicycling, but the public transit, the bus service in our community is important when I do need to get around, it allows me, our household to be car free. Um, it has some other benefits, a lot of people like traveling by public transit because rather than driving because it means they can get some work done or they can relax on their way to and from work. Um, so in some ways it's a better user experience. Uh, it's far more affordable to rely on public transit for commuting than it is to own a car and some other benefits. Okay, so here's my question. To what degree does the air taxi services that you're proposing, that you're, we're hearing about here, fulfill the, the goals, the, the roles of public transit. And um, so let me go through some of my analysis that I think um, uh, puts this into perspective. And uh, now, I'm, I, I, I recognize that none of us really know how air taxi services are eventually gonna look or function. Um, so I'm basing it on the literature that I've reviewed, a lot of it by the people in this room. Okay, so advocates assume that air taxis will be convenient, comfortable, and faster than surface travel. But this is not necessarily true. Many designs have only two seats. A taxi has four seats. Sometimes, how, even though you can, liter, you can legitimately say that most trips, most car trips only have one or two passengers, there are still maybe um, um, uh, uh, 10 or or. or or 15% of your trips will not be satisfied. You're traveling with more than two people, and so the air taxi will be too small. Um, it's, if it's heavily used, if an autonomous vehicle is heavily used, it's gonna get a lot of wear and tear. So when we see these pictures, the, the vehicles are always looking shiny and clean. Um, the artist re renditions, what does a taxi look like? At a typical interior of the taxi look like after a couple years of use. And now, most taxis have, or a typical taxi has an operator, a driver, who will clean up after and all that. But in practice, public transit agencies have to be very careful to harden the interiors of the vehicles. So you are not gonna have padded leather seats in most air taxis, they're gonna be cheap, vinyl, and you're going to have a lot of chrome, and you're not going to have really nice finishes because passengers are rough. And those vehicles are going to be kind of cramped and maybe uncomfortable and a lot of... And so here's the question. 
on a bus, I can sit down, open up my notebook computer, and get some work done. Is that going to be true on an air taxi? Is the flight experience going to be relaxing and allow you to get work done? Um, uh, what portion of time will they not operate due to weather? So just like um, uh, 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 because they're light and small, they're going to be very sensitive to weather. And if service has to be curtailed, let's say, 10% um, uh, uh, of the time because of, because of weather, high winds or, or, or wet conditions, that's going to be a significant unreliability. And also, um, as I'll talk about later, compared with door-to-door -door vehicle travel, they'll require additional time to access and wait for a flight. So I know some of the models are predicting that they'll be, in a typical neighborhood, there'll be this constant flow, and you will only have to wait seconds or minutes to get on, the, on, the, on, a, on one of these air taxis. I'm a little skeptical that they're going to be that efficient uh, in most conditions. OK, here's another point is that um, Optimists estimate that air taxis uh, will be uh, so beneficial to users and that there'll be this huge demand because of the time savings. So the basic reason that you would leave your car at home and use an air taxi is you're going to save about half an hour on a typical trip. Well, let's say you're going to save somewhere between uh, 20, let's say between 15 minutes and an hour for a typical urban trip compared with driving. Um, but um, the consumers, now, if you're traveling on business, you can, your, 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 your employer can justify paying quite a bit to save your time if those are wages, you know, typically at, say, 40, or 50, 40 to $60 an hour. But individuals usually value their time at about a quarter of that, that a quarter of their average wage. And so... Um, I suspect that there will be, there are actually many reasons that people would, would not choose the fastest form of travel, and part of it is financial, that most people will only pay about $10 an hour to save their personal time, not $40 or $50 an hour of their wage. But also, think about, for example, you require a vehicle at your destination. It's faster to drive, even though it takes more time to get to that destination, it's faster to drive rather than take an air taxi and then have to rent a car at the destination. And if you're carrying heavy loads, traveling with children, uh, people who dislike um, um, uh, flying, or if you have an autonomous car that's going to drive you there, you might be willing to spend, let's say, an hour and a half to get to a destination rather than an hour in the, um, in the, in the, in the air taxi because you're able to be productive. So these are all things that I think need to be taken into account in the demand model. Um, crash risks. Now, as you know, we all know, uh, general aviation has by far the highest crash rate. And um, small planes have high crash rates, crash casualty rates. OK, so um, optimists say autonomous, since, since dry, uh, pilot error contributes to about half of all crashes, um, we're going to, that, that these vehicles will be super safe. These, these planes will be super safe. But autonomous vehicles introduce a whole bunch of additional crash risks. Uh, the vehicle failures, the control system failures, malicious hacking, um, just the traffic density. So you have, there's a very well-established relationship between traffic density and crash crash frequency. The more vehicles that are on the roads, the more chance of a crash. And um, so the, if you have urban skies full of these little airplanes, there's an increased chance that two of them are going to crash into each other. And if it stimulates more driving, more uh, travel in general, you're going to get more exposure. That even if you have low crash rates per let's say, uh, passenger, million passenger kilometers or miles, it, it, you still might have more an increase in crashes. OK, user costs. Are they going to be affordable? Well, again, the optimistic projections are that they're going to cost somewhere between $10 and $30 for a local trip. OK, that's cheaper than commercial air fl flights, but it is not affordable. It's not an affordable option for a typical middle or lower income 
commuter. Um, so I don't think you can claim that air taxis are anything like affordable. Now, even low-income people may occasionally use them for a special trip. There are some situations where you have urgency and, you, and even low-income people would use them, but it is not going to be a commute mode for the majority of households. Uh, noise optimists claim that small electric airplanes can produce minimal noise. Um, under optimal conditions, maybe they can avoid exceeding neighborhood noise limits. But what portion of time will, they be, will there be some conditions that cause noise levels to be exceeded? Let me give you an example. Um, in the past, we usually modeled passenger weights at about 150 pounds, 100 to 150 pounds for an average person. But there are lots of places where average body weights have increased and it would be really easy, it would be fairly frequent that there would be two passengers in an air taxi, each of whom weighs 250 pounds. Will that extra weight cause the plane to exceed noise limits? Is that the kind of thing where suddenly you're gonna have 10 or 20% of trips that violate your in optimal noise standard? Okay, what about energy consumption? Okay, um, aviation is inherently energy intensive. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do to increase the efficiency, but getting a body a, you know, a, a, a vehicle and a body up into the air takes energy. A, a significant amount of energy, much more energy than, um, than, than surface modes. Okay, so you can, you can, that's five minutes, right? Okay, so you can, um, you can do some um, optimistic assumptions. If you compare electric airplanes with a gasoline car, the electric airplane looks good. But what if you compare electric airplanes with electric cars? Well, it's not gonna look so good. Um, then there are a number of land use impacts, what you could call the costs, the additional sprawl. So uh, you could think of, for example, uh, a, a, the, a, uh, an executive trying to decide where to start a business. And with air taxis, they'll say, oh, I'm going to move to someplace in the Central Valley and be able to assume I'll be able to get my business done, rather than getting, starting their business somewhere in the, 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 urban, the existing urban area. Well, that's going to leverage their employees are all going to have to drive, as opposed to if their business had been started in uh, walkable urban neighborhoods. Um, so there's a leverage effect. Um, there's the access to the air terminal. So you would have to have very high densities of those little uh, air parks if you're going to expect a significant portion of the passengers actually walking to the, and biking to the, to, to the airport. In most cases, the, pass, the users will have to drive, which means they need a vehicle. It means you need a lot of parking. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, go through some of the policy issues. Uh, we need to define the role that air taxis play in a transportation system, develop regulations to capture electric autonomous flight risks, review and certify control, uh, cont the control software, and hold software designers accountable for errors, uh, evaluate impacts under non-standard operating conditions, develop robust airworthiness regulations, such as pre-flight and post-flight inspections, battery checks, preventive maintenance, develop onboard fire detection and suppression systems, develop local air control and microclimate weather forecasting, protect against birds, bird um, uh, strikes. Okay, so here are my discussion questions. Uh, to what degree do air taxis achieve basic mobility, affordability, resource efficiency benefits provided by something like conventional public transit. Should public policies encourage air uh, taxi development if it cannot achieve all of those design objectives? For example, if it has relatively high crash rates or produces more noise than neighbors consider acceptable? And does, uh, does electric air taxi service really reduce pollution if by encouraging more trips and sprawl development, it increases total 
per capita vehicle travel or if a portion of electricity is generated by fossil fuels. Okay, one last thing. Should air taxi service be promoted as a sustainable transportation strategy or constrained to only operate within resource efficient and social equity constraints? Um, should we support air taxi services? They fail to meet some of these sustainability objectives. So I will end there, and uh, it looks like I have some questions, right? Uh, Todd, these are perfect questions for the panel discussion. So since we're running a little bit over time, I'd love to have these questions be brought up to the panel when we, when yeah. we conclude. Mm -hmm. Thank you.